I'm welcoming to the stage oh, yeah. Nate Langston, who's the editor of Wired.co.uk, and Steve Wozniak. Thank you very much. Good morning. Sorry to make sure I'm not <laughs> breathing too much down my microphone. Um, welcome, Steve. Pleasure, good. as I'm sure it is for everyone sitting I here. Like, I like a good short introduction. Let's go. <laughs> well, I think um, uh, it's uh, everyone's looking forward. We've got about an hour, of about 45 minutes, about an hour. We're going to do a little Q&A afterwards, so uh, get those questions uh, thinking. So, question. Actually, before we get to a question, I wanted to show something that you just gave to me upstairs. Has anyone ever seen one of Steve Wozniak's business cards? It might be the coolest business card I have ever seen. <laughs> And the history behind it is actually cooler, which is after 9-11, the airplanes started using plastic knives and they didn't cut stuff very well. So I made my, metal, my cards out of metal so I could cut the stakes well. And the stewardesses always said, oh, a metal business card. They never said, hey, that's a knife. <laughs> so I like to play with the systems a little bit. It's a minor form of hacking, you know? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about the time that uh, you uh, printed your own money. Uh, that's certainly, I think, classes as uh, playing with the system. Um, so first, obviously, we're here uh, to talk about apps. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, startups. We're going to talk about wearable tech. We're going to talk about smart watches. We're going to talk about Apple. That'll probably come as no surprise um, either. But first, I wanted, to, I wanted to ask a quick question. What was the last app you used before we got on stage? Uh, I don't know. I think I was trying to... Um Trying to figure out why Vodafone wouldn't um, give me SMS messages when I supposedly have a <laughs> an account that gets that. <laughs> so okay, yeah, so, I have to go back. I did a, I did a bunch of the updating of the phone this morning when I woke up. So uh, so I, it's hard to say that I've had time to use an app yet. Oh, I used um sure I used Sunrise Calendar, which is my Google. It shows me my Google Calendar to check the um the timing and the appearances and how I would get into this place. Yeah, that was it. So, when we look at the smartphone market, we see Apple, obviously, we see Android, uh, we're seeing a growing adoption of, of Windows Phone and, uh, and the liberal use of the other color yellow there, uh, and BlackBerry, of course. Um, but which, which of these platforms excites you the most at the moment? Who's, who's doing the most interesting stuff in that well, space? Well, yeah, exciting is different than just what do I like. I really still like the iPhone the best for a lot of different reasons. And, um, you know, trust and validity and reliability and ex things working, you know, um, you kind of, that's one of the most important things in our computer world these days. But I also knew the guy that was behind Android very well, and he had a strong Apple Macintosh background in his head and his thinking and make things easy for users. And at first I bought Android phones, I bought one after another after another, because I do personal experimentation. I go to stores, I buy them like a normal person, I try things out and I didn't like them, and I kind of didn't like things about it up until maybe the Nexus One. And there's a few that I've liked a little along the way, but then when it came to the um, Samsung Galaxy S3 and the Galaxy Note, I held them in my hands, showing them to friends at dinner, and I thought, these have, are pretty good phones. The collection of apps really is what, what really defines your life anyway. Mm -hmm. And I think people have pretty much defined I don't think features really make a difference in phones anymore. I don't think people say, oh, you've got, I mean, sure, if you, use, if you use iPhone, you'll say, it does this and another one doesn't, and that's my reason. And that's not really the reason, because you can come up with features after features and experiments, the stuff that we used to call innovation. You can come up with a lot of that stuff, and people really don't switch. There's kind of like two main camps right now, and Windows is trying to come in, and they've got some, you know, an awful lot of followers from Windows in the computing era, and they've got their tablets, and they got their computers, and they, they work similarly, and they look pretty good, but they're going to struggle a little bit, so I think it's Android and iPhones, and Androids are kind of fun for seeing new little things. How did somebody think of this little, you know, swipe to get the screen snapshot, or looks at my face, and I blink, and it, and it unlocks the phone. So they're, they're fun, too, but so are the iPhones. And, you, and you've got, you carry two but iPhones. But I don't think, but I think people are pretty much are in a camp, one camp or another, and it's like the actual percentages of sales aren't really dependent upon what features are there. Yeah. You gotta, you've got to hold your market. But the trouble is, companies get into where they have a money machine. You know, there was a time we had Macintoshes and we could sell so many into the schools, so many to people, and so many into, into um, in industry, not too many, but 
Um, and we just crank it out and make out the new Macintoshes all the time, and it kept it going. But it wasn't sort of that new unexpected stuff that Apple's known for. So, um, so that's a little bit of what goes on. But you don't, you know, the unexpected stuff, you don't see it until it's here. You know, strong secrecy. Steve Jobs learned that from showing Bill Gates the, uh, the Lisa um, GUI computer. You know, don't, don't show off what you're doing. Make it a big surprise. And the marketing advantage is good marketing, mm. which is good. Anyway. <laughs> so, so I'm going to say I, I get a lot of interest out of a lot of different Android apps, and especially the HTC One and the Samsung Galaxy S4, because my eye is often drawn to the nice, big, glowing screens. What, what phone do you have there, you know, is what I want to ask. But I'm very familiar with the iPhone, and there's things I want that aren't, aren't, aren't in it. You'll never get everything you want in one phone. Go on, then. What's the one thing you want in that iPhone? I don't know. You know, I'd actually like a larger screen. Mm. I find the larger screens easier to deal with, even the, the note size. And, and if it's sitting on your dashboard in a car, it's much easier to read, and you have more space for your fingers. But, um, but I don't think, but, but like I said, those features don't make a phone market anymore. We sort of talk like, oh my gosh, this phone has this. You go down a checklist, check, 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 check for this model phone compared to the others, and what are their speeds, and what are their what what features do they have, and how what quality is the picture from the camera? I mean, good lord, the HTC One with four megapixel cameras. I take a lot of pictures, and they're awfully good. <laughs> they're like the best. So you can't really use a spreadsheet to say this is what phone's going to sell. And how do you feel about the size of, of, of phones? I mean, you say you quite like a, a larger iPhone. I mean, we're starting to see now Android phones and even Windows phones, actually, as of, as of yesterday, that are pushing six inches. You know, I mean, how you do you feel what? about it? Is that a good size? That's a, probably a little large for me because like, you come from the, where the background of using cell phones where it was better to get them smaller and smaller and smaller before they had screens you had to read and you had to use for your input-output. Um, so I think six inches might be a little large. On the other hand, Apple came out with an iPad mini at seven inches, and I thought, wow, my Kindle is seven inches, and it fits in my pocket with cell phones and all. It fits in actually nicely, and I could be wearing Kindle right now, and I thought, I want that. And then the iPad mini was just a hair too large. It's more like eight inches, a little too large for my pocket. But um, if something fit in there, it would still be usable, but I think the uh, Galaxy Note is probably the largest, largest I'd want. But I don't mind the Note. I kind of like it. Kind of like the size. It it is a livable world, and all the trouble is all the all of the real noted phones today, they're all they're all good. You can't criticize and say one of them is bad because of this one lousy feature it has or one thing it doesn't do. You can't say that to anybody. Everybody who's got it knows they're living their life, and most of the life really isn't the phone anyway. It's apps. You know, you've made your choice on a on a um, on a care on a, a platform, and the platform is almost independent, too, between Android and iOS. For most of the key apps are, are implemented in high, high volume for both. And do, you think, do you think Apple, Apple uh, will do a larger iPhone? I mean, it, it stayed basically the same size since its inception. You know, I've been, yeah, but I've been thinking they would a long time before this. <laughs> um, as a matter of fact, they increased the size to the iPhone 5 from the iPhone 4, but they increased it in one dimension only. <laughs> I think it would have been smarter to expand it and keep the, then the programmers would have one aspect ratio and you could just scale everything. I think that would have made a lot of sense, but Apple had already taken this defensive position of how do you compare to these Android phones? You'd walk into a store and every phone was large and then the iPhone had the smallest screen of all. And that was a little disappointing. It was kind of like old days when you saw a whole bunch of brands of computers and only one Macintosh from Apple. Um, it it sets, an, sets an image like, where is Apple in the game? And, um, and I wanted a large screen. I just don't know why they chose that. But Apple defensively said, you can operate an iPhone with one hand, and you can't operate the others with one hand. And you know, sometimes you, everybody finds that's actually um, true and useful, but not, it's not a 100% thing. It, I don't think, like I said, I don't think features really determine who's the popular phone. There's a lot of things in culture and society that have determined where the two brands fit. And I think Apple um, captured a lot of the culture just with, um, with the brand from the past, with the image of the company, what we stand for, with the beauty of the phones. And then I think the rest of the world doesn't like the Apple fanboys. And tell you the truth, I'm one of them. <laughs> but the rest of the world says, we just hate those Apple people almost. And, and we'd r I'd rather use the, um, the, uh, the Androids because I've also got more freedom of um, you know, just writing my own apps and developing software. And it's a little easy. The steps are a little bit easier sometimes and unrestricted. So it's more open in a sense. So one of the emerging trends we're seeing at the moment is, is smartwatches. 
and, and, and apps being developed for, for devices we're wearing on our wrists. Now, when you look at these smartwatches, we've seen some from Samsung, we've seen one from Sony, we've got the Pebble and things like that. Like, when you look at those, what do you see? Do you see a product that is, that is actually a compelling idea? Actually, yeah. Um, what, what, what I think of smartwatches is, okay, some years ago, oh my gosh, my friends in Germany, my friend in Germany was wearing a watch that was a cell phone. Okay, it was a cell phone, not a smart watch. And um, I got this iPod Nano, um, you know, a couple of years ago, I've been wearing it on every airplane flight, and I fly constantly, and I use it for music, and I, I listen to music the whole flight, and it's nice to scroll with my hand. I say, what a neat interface, scrolling rather than pushing buttons. I don't know. A lot of times, just the way things feel to your muscles really makes a huge difference, just like the iPad, scrolling it. And I thought, well, it's limited. It's only an iPod. I wish I had my whole my whole smartphone here. As a matter of fact, I really want to ask it Siri questions and get answers to, you know, to difficult questions, you know, like is the population of one country larger than that of another and come up with an answer. So I wanted the smartphone. I've been talking about that for two years publicly, you know, that I, I envision a smartphone would be nice. But the trouble is now all the smartphones are taken off based on the iPod Nano, roughly this size, Sony, Qualcomm, um, uh, Nokia, who else, Samsung, Samsung, they're all coming out this size, and I expect there's going to be about 30 of them soon because it's a pretty easy technology to make. And how smart are they? Are they the complete phone, or do they have to link to your phone with Bluetooth to really um, use cellular at all? You know, is the cellular going to be built into it or external? It'll probably be external like Google Glass is now. But I've been saying I want a wearable phone. So I don't have to even reach in my pocket. I don't even want to carry my phone, though. I want the whole complete thing. Recently, though, I started saying, I don't like this small size for a phone. It doesn't have enough output device. It doesn't have enough for me to see what's going on and what I'm trying to get information about and to use and scroll through. It complicates my life too much being small. I want something closer to the size of, let's say, an iPhone today or whatever phone today. And that means a little larger on the wrist or something. Maybe it folds over your wrist to give you more square inches. And, of course, we're real close to the folding displays. They're just starting to pop out in products now. Well, one week ago, I was, you know, my, my brain sometimes comes up with weirder thoughts when I'm falling asleep or waking up. And I was in Quito, Ecuador, and I thought, oh, my gosh, how about the inside of your wrist? You could have the whole thing wrap around your wrist. The inside of your wrist has more room to hide a full-size phone. But then I thought, you know, I can grab my wrist with my hand like this, and I fold my hand over, and it fits. It fits on both sides of the hump over my wrist to the hand. And that made me think, oh, my gosh, I could have a phone that I flip out. This would be so cool. Flip open, and maybe when you flip it open, it's got flexible materials and springs and stretches a little kind of straight. And once you flip it open, you can still use it two-handed, you know, or you can flip it shut. And when you flip it shut, it grabs around your wrist a little, you know, like, just like those things you, you whack on and they grab your wrist. Um, so, I, I would, so I'm starting to think that would be a kind of a neat phone. Flip it open and take a phone call, flip it open and do whatever, do your little Siri on it. And, the front, and, the, and if it wraps around your wrist, the whole band could also be displaying some useful information about what's happening in your life. Google Now could be there or something. You talk about, you so talk about I, Siri. So, so that's just an idea that I haven't, haven't heard or read. But you know what? Apple usually comes out and likes to astound the world. And everybody's going to make smartwatch, 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 a bigger smartwatch, a, bi a bigger smartwatch, a smaller smartwatch, a bigger smartwatch. And then Apple will have something so different. So maybe they'll do something weird like what I'm talking about because that would shock the world. Oh, I never thought of that before. It's very hard to come up with these ideas. They just have to kind of float to the right people in the companies. And what, what, sort of, what sort of apps do you think would, would make for a really compelling smartwatch experience? Because at the moment, a lot of them are sort of, we'll read your email and we'll read out a text and things like that. I and mean, one of the things that seems to be missing, actually, at the moment is, is maps. Yeah. You know, it doesn't seem to be a common thing that people are talking about on this. But what would you want on, on a watch aside from? Well, the trouble is, I'm not different than anyone else here. And rare, different ideas than ever before aren't easy to come by you can start working long, long, long about some good things you would like on it. And I might say, you know, I want Google Now. I want up-to-date stuff about myself. I really want this watch to have a camera on full-time someday. Low battery power. And I want it to notify me, oh, Steve, there's that accessory you wanted in that store. And, and I, see, I see a cake store, and there's a birthday coming up. I really want that knowledge navigator type stuff on my smart watch. And so I think what I want, I hope that that's what other people would want, too. Um, 
and you know, watch will say, oh, Steve, you better look at that girl over there. Oh. <laughs> You know, so I so I'm basically helpful things to normal human things in just leading your life a little bit better with a helping aid is, you know, what technology is really all about that we really love so much. And I'm really closely oriented towards that consumer thinking. So what I want, um, I hope I hope other people want it enough that these things happen. But you see, the trouble is I'm starting now thinking, well, we have Google now and we have Siri. I got to have Siri or something like it to you know, navigate to the convention center, and it takes me there. Um, so, you know, those are the common things, though. What haven't, hasn't been done, you can't necessarily just sit here and think of. I mean, just weird ideas pop out, and every other, every idea that seems to have some use in life, everyone thinks, oh my gosh, this is the start of a company. This is, a, the word nowadays is it's a billion dollar idea. It might just be a piece of plastic, but you say it's a billion dollar idea. Just because it has some use to somebody, you may never be able to sell one in the world. But now we're starting to move to where people have to use the word. It's a trillion dollar idea to <laughs> get heard. I, I can't <laughs> help but notice, by the way, that you, you have another watch on here that appears to be powered by vacuum tubes. Yes. Yeah, my favorite <laughs> watch. This is my watch for telling time. And it has vacuum tubes inside that haven't been made in 45 years. Back to the old days of television sets before the transistor came along. Um, the, these tubes are running on 140 volts inside the watch. And it's waterproof watch, so you can take it in the bathtub once. <laughs> and when I turn my wrist, hours and minutes. Big glowing digits. Okay, this watch is unusual. Airport security people, are they, they're not afraid that it's dangerous or something. Um, I got a loose power connector right now. But the big glowing digits, it displays two digits of hours and minutes in order. It's the way you would speak it. It's very natural. There's a guy that builds it by hand in Tucson, Arizona. I bought mine online. I wasn't smart enough to think of the idea, but I would have loved to have built it. Got a little PIC microprocessor in there. And, um, and it's, it's, I first put it on because I like unusual different things. You know, ride segways, buy this because it's a way out of the normal, and just try it out and see if they're, they're any good. A lot of them are really duds. Well, this watch I was going to show to my gadget friends for a week. One week I was going to say, look at this, this is cool. It's got tubes that tell the time. And, uh, and after I showed it to my gadget friends for three days, I started realizing these big glowing digits were easier on my brain than any watch I've ever owned in my life. And I always acknowledge technology is better if I feel that I'm working less. I'm lazy, you know. And if I'm not having to think, and I'm not having to do things and work, it's a better product. So I actually use it for the time. It's my favorite time-telling watch ever just because it's easy, convenient, and I just don't feel like I'm struggling to, to um, see what the time is. Well, another thing that can help see what the time is is, is something that's uh, floating in your peripheral vision. Uh, things like Google Glass, uh, we're seeing a lot more now conversations about Glass, about wearable techs. I read a rumor yesterday that Microsoft may uh, be working on something similar to Google Glass. I'm pretty sure I've seen at least one person here this morning that's wearing Google Glass. Don't know if they're around. Uh, maybe not. The last um, two days, I actually encountered um, one person at a dinner in a restaurant and one person um, in, just at an airport. And oh my gosh, they had to show me their Google Glass. And of course, I know the people at Google well. I could have had Google Glass from the start, but I'm in a very busy period of my life. And the people who test a new product, I felt it's for a new product like Google Glass, it should be the people that have time to really test it and put it through its paces. And I shouldn't deprive one of them of a Google Glass. So I don't have one yet, but I drool over it every time I see it. And the one time I used one briefly, it was a, a very thrilling experience. But sometimes these things are, you know, oh my gosh, I want to try it, I want to have it. And then after a short period of time, maybe you get used to it. Because I see Google Glass and I, what do I think of? I think of the Bluetooth headsets. And we all went through this experience. We got our Bluetooth headset and we're using it, showing it off to our friends for a day or a week. Some, some people were hardcore and they'd go a whole month and then you just get rid of it. <laughs> so I don't know, um, I, but I, I like the idea and I like the idea that it's sort of self-contained and at least through Wi-Fi, attaches to the internet. I hear the battery's a little low, but um, you know, heck, um, I, I, I really want one so badly. And my, what I want is what I think is the world wants some wearable technology. We're going to have to figure out what really goes in the end, and it may be more than one mode. Is there anything in, in particular that would sort of when you think about these sort of wearable technology, you think, this is a problem, that device solves it? 
Um, well, of course. Well, with that, that's wearable technology. Every little device, our whole career since the Apple II computer, personal computer eras, and then ease of computing with Macintoshes that were, they got more human, more like the way humans treat things. And we got up to, you know, social networks, the way we live our lives. And we got mobile. And mobile just allowed us to have apps and carry our entire computer world with us. But it's so close now. Almost everybody walks around like it's another limb to their body. My smartphone, and I'm doing so much on it. It's my communications gap to the world. And it's starting to become like a little friend because you talk to it the way a human talks to a human, and sometimes you get answers. So um, it's going to get better. Artificial intelligence is going to get better. We don't know what intelligence is is the problem, not yet. But um, it's like a little person. It's going to be my best friend someday. But to have it on me, you see, they got smaller. The products got smaller and smaller and smaller every step of the evolution. And, uh, well, except for maybe the bigger phones. <laughs> <laughs> um, they got smaller, and that means more personal and close to you. Well, what's the closest of all is if you're wearing it, you don't have to think about it. I don't have to pull a phone out of my pocket, you know, and make sure I pull the right phone out and... And um, it's just right here, more, more closer to me. The best is if you don't think about anything at all. Every step we take in computers that makes it easier and you don't have to think about things and memorize what to do is better. So I really, I really want the wearable technology, but I've got to have the human voice because mm. then I don't have to remember procedures. Remember the old days of DOS? You had to type all these commands you memorized, and we came out with the Macintosh, and we said, this is the future for the world. You'll just look at things and drag them where you want them. You know, and, and it had oversights because you had to worry about files and stuff. But, um, but then you didn't have to memorize all these things. Well, right now with our apps even, you have to memorize a lot of things. I want to see the day when almost all the apps that come out are allowed to put the voice recognition in, Android or Google. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons I don't like the Windows 8 phones as much is because I can't operate a lot of them by voice. And I really want to do everything I can from just text dictation to, um, to you know, navigation commands to getting answers about the world. And I've heard you say before that, that what we really need is something a little bit like Apple Script for voice. That's, wait a minute. That's what I've been saying for years <laughs> to our Apple Script expert in Apple, that we should have Apple Script on the iPhone and the iPad. Oh, no, Apple has this rule against programming languages. And in my mind, I believe, without knowing the facts, that it's because if you had a programming language on a phone, somebody could publish a program, even in written form, and anybody could type it in and have ability to go around Apple's App Store to get programs that ran. But um, what I wanted was Siri came out, okay? Siri was, was, existed before Apple bought Siri. It was an app. And I would use it, and I would say, what are the five largest lakes in California? One, two, three, four, five, I'd get the answer. Beautiful from Wolfram Alpha. The week that Apple bought Siri, I was demonstrating at shows like this, and I said, what are the five largest lakes in California? And it hit me with a bunch of lakeside selling property, real estate, <laughs> spam stuff, you know. And, and then I used this other one. I would say, what are the prime numbers greater than 87? And the week that Apple bought Siri, it started saying prime rib steakhouses, you know. And that sickened me. But then I found out later on, you are allowed to say, Wolfram Alpha, what are the five largest lakes in the United Kingdom? And Wolfram Alpha can handle relationships. It's more mathematical. I mean, somebody should have been smart enough to look at your words and see that when you say five largest, it's a mathematical relationship. Go to Wolfram Alpha. Don't try to search the web or search your own Siri database. But um, uh, that got around it. So I thought, I'm directing my command to Wolfram Alpha. I could also say Google something. And I don't have to have the phone come back and say, do you want to look it up on the web? It just does a Google search for what I say. I'm talking to Google. Well, that's how AppleScript works. AppleScript's a language on our Macintosh computers. That's, you don't have a defined language. Every application on the computer gets to write its own verbs and nouns, its own commands, and add to the dictionary. And you are talking to one application program at a time on a Macintosh when you write AppleScript programs. So you will say, tell mail to duplicate the front window, something like that. And your commands will be very different if you're talking to Foursquare to check in to the theater or something like that. And um, I want that to be applied to my speech that I can control all the apps that the app writers can put their own dictionary in the way everybody did with AppleScript in the old days. And uh, let's see, that's just a wish list. I, I don't know if Apple ever hears me when talking that one. While, but, but, but it would really give me a lot, lot good, better voice control to every single app. All the major apps would, would include this AppleScript-ish thing. 
So it wouldn't be fitting that we didn't ask something about Apple. It's actually quite conveniently timed, uh, this interview today, because last night, Apple announced a whole lot of new stuff. New iPads, new Macs, mm -hmm. new Mac Pros, things like that. Um, have you had a chance to, to, to take a look at, at, at those? Anything that sort of jumps out and says, wow, Yeah, I am that. constantly following the gadget and the product world, and it's so important to me. And I'm always, if I'm, if I'm in town, I attend the events. I was invited. If I'm out of town, I'm watching the live blogs online. I was on a plane all last night. So I missed it all. And when I got in, I, I looked at the products and... Um, the iPads didn't hit my needs. Yes, thinner, lighter, smaller. Totally good. They'll, they'll keep, that's just the new iPad. It kind of, you, I don't think they, they're going to sell the old and the new, so it just replaces it. It's guaranteed high sales from day one. But the trouble is, I, need, I don't have broadband at home, and I travel so much. I'm in hotels. Well, you don't have broadband at home. No, and in hotels, you don't have broadband. So I carry a lot of my personal media a lot of um, the Big Bang Theory TV shows and, and videos and audio and all that, I like to carry it. And 120 gigabytes for the current iPad. I was hoping Apple would have a 256 gigabyte version so I could put all the seasons of the Big Bang Theory on one iPad. But it didn't, it didn't come out. That was all I looked for. And so, so I emailed my wife, nope, don't want one of those. But they, upped the, uh, they did up the MacBook Pro, which is the heart of my life for computing. Um, especially since I type a lot in Dvorak, avoiding my fingers having to move a long distance. And, um, and they upped it to a terabyte instead of three quarters of a terabyte for the built-in solid state disk. So, um, so eh, that one hit a sweet spot. But yeah, I didn't see the show, so I didn't see a lot of the introduction of, of Maverick. I just installed it this morning, mm. so I haven't even had a chance to play with it yet. I installed new operating systems on my iPhones, and one of them made it, and one of them didn't because Vodafone's not playing the game. Um, so, I mean, what, 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 what did what, you asked one question about something? Uh, probably about you not having broadband at home, which uh, is um, yeah. hugely surprising. Yeah, um, broadband is it's surprising. Forty percent of Americans don't have broadband in one survey, and I don't. It's not my choice. It's I don't have a choice. It's a monopoly. There's only one place I could possibly get broadband over wires and they don't run good enough wires, it's a lousy phone company, and they, one of the two Verizon hardwired companies in the United States that doesn't run any fiber at all, and I live in the wrong city. So, yeah, satellite, I've, I've tried in the past, and it doesn't really get the throughput and the um, latency and the continuance, the continuality that I needed. I haven't tried it recently. I also, the best I could do is get a microwave link to somebody else, but I don't like to go my microphone's running out, guys. Um, so I've been burned in the past, and um, we'll, get, we'll fix it a little bit. I'll just pull the receiver out of my pocket. So, yes, you're right. I have other solutions, and I have LTE on my phone. Yeah, LTE on my phone. Um, at my home, when LTE first got introduced near me, I was getting 7 to 10 megabits. Doesn't sound like much. I've been in Turkey, and on 3G, I got 42 megabits to my iPhone. So I just happen to live slightly in a hill, you know, one kilometer out of town, that's all, out of Silicon, the main part of Silicon Valley. And um, now, but now the LTE often goes down to one megabit per second. I guess so many people using it in our area, um, I can't really count on it. So, no, I cannot order a movie from iTunes and watch it right away. Sometimes I have to wait hours before I can watch it, and by then I don't want to. <laughs> so that's life. Um, and, and it's very sad because I used to be the king of the hill. Man, back in the days when everybody had dial-up modems at 28K baud, and they went up to 50K baud, I had a one megabit, one and a half megabit T1 line up and down, racks of servers in my home, you know, serving lots of stuff. But So I was king of the hill, and now T1 line is, you know, bottom. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about, about, uh, about startups, about new developers, about new products. Um, there's probably quite a lot of developers, I think, uh, in this room right now. Um, what sort of parallels do you draw between, say, the early days of Apple, those sort of first garage months, and, and, and today's sort of startup scene and new developers? What advice or, or what, what lessons do you think you learned in those early days well, that can still be applied hey, today? That's two questions, parallels and advice. <laughs> parallels, you know, I think about it, and my first response is, well, it's the same thing. But no, it isn't, because back then, startups were a little bit... Um, unusual and you start something on your own. Look at the, in California, 
was a hot spot for a lot of them, you know. And places like Google, if you even look at Microsoft, Apple, Yahoo in its day, Facebook, they all kind of started with um, just young people just sort of going on their own way and, and no prescribed formula. But now apps are so big. There's so much of a market, there's so many of them, that if you have a winner, you make a lot of money. It's such a big deal that everybody's out there trying to think of it in terms of maximizing a company and planning everything and, and doing more of the, the business from a planned business point of view. When we started Apple, our business was accidental. Steve Jobs just wanted to have a successful company, and he did all the business on the phone, you know, ordering parts and getting sales and getting publicity. One thing that I do see is publicity matters a lot. We had a lot of publicity because nobody was against us. No big companies thought our personal computers were going to be successful in that early startup phase. So all the press was hot on this neat story, including two kids starting in a garage, but the whole idea of little computers that would be in your own home was a hot story until they became very successful. And then the big companies sort of had to respond as competitors more. And today, you almost start out, and it's such a huge market for everything you've almost got to think, oh my gosh, I've got competition from the start, and what am I trying to do? Are you also, also I think that apps, are you trying to do something, when we started Apple, we started with a really advanced product, I hate to say it, the Apple II, but it was all of the revenues and profits of Apple for the first 10 years of the company. We went through failures of the Apple III, the Lisa, and the Macintosh trying to build other computers, and we just failed over and over. And we had to actually modify the Macintosh and market it heavily to get it to sell for three years after Steve Jobs left. It was by people that he disdained that made it finally go. We believed it was the future, but we had to, we had to, the market was a lot tougher to face now. Marketing's the most important thing. It's, it's a lot easier to think of an app and write it than to figure out a way to convince people to buy it. I'm sure a lot of you in this room have found that. Very difficult to get the message out. Very important to get good publicity in the right places. Because public journals, public, the right blogs can reach 10,000 people, 100,000 people, a million people in one shot. And um, so you've got to really be focused on thinking, how do I get my product noticed? And it just doesn't necessarily happen all by its own. Sure, you hear stories about um, you know, Facebook or Google just instantly catching on, or Netscape, instantly catching on and flooding the world you know, in a month. But um, that's, that's, not, that's not typical. Even Apple's not a typical story. So that's the comparison. What was the second part of the question? I think it's sort of advice. Uh, advice, oh, well. But I kind of, that was sort of factored in, I suppose. Yeah, marketing. but uh, obviously, yeah, obviously, treat, treat it as marketing is the most important. What is marketing? More than anything else, it is being a user of your product. When I worked at Hewlett Packard, we were an engineering driven corporation and I developed the early computers of Apple there. I tried to, I tried to get HP to do it, they turned me down five times. But how come we were engineering driven? That meant that engineers could come up with the product ideas that would become products that would take a division of Hewlett Packard for the next decade. Normally those ideas come down from management, they come down from marketing, figuring out what are the needs of the user, what are the price ranges, what are the features. Um, well at Hewlett Packard, back in those days, we were only building tools that engineers used. So we engineers were the market. We totally understood it. We understood what was needed, what was good and what was bad, so the ideas could come out of our own head, which was very motivating, very personal. But then when we started Apple, no, the, the whole, we changed the, the fundamental direction. We're gonna be market oriented. We're gonna understand people, their needs. We're gonna modify products accordingly. We're gonna write software that fills those needs and develop extra hardware and um, be very attentive to the end user. So it always helps if you are. If you're not an end user and you have a good idea, you'd better find one of those people that is a good end user and become partners with them even when you're running on zero dollars. Find somebody that'll be friend with you and really help tell you what to do. And also if you're a businessman, please find the engineer. Maybe most of you in this room are programmers, but please find the engineers, you know, because engineering is so difficult and you have to think of clever ways to solve problems and get things to work. And the engineers' minds are so clever, they'll think of things you didn't think of for your own product idea, you know, that are, are, that are possible, that it'll just be ideas that come to them. And don't ever expect the answers to come instantly. A lot of people like to have a meeting, we formalize it, we write it down, and this is what our company's gonna build. Give it time to gel, you know, a, at least one night, but half a week, maybe a month, and all of a sudden you're thinking about an idea for that long, and those oddball ideas that don't pop into other people's heads will come to you. And also, if you write an app or something like that, your goal should be, 
how could, what could I do to make it better than anybody else in the world would do? Or at least as good as anyone else in the world could possibly do. Excellence is absolutely important um, in my mind uh, for every product there is. And sometimes you think, I'll just add one little touch or I'll, I'll improve the graphics or I'll simplify an approach in there. You give it a second try. Yeah, that's, that takes a little extra time and sometimes it violates the idea of having fixed schedules and quotas and things like that. But um, that's, that's the advice I give. Think, allow, you got to mix the creative thinking with the very well-skilled um, people that know how to build things out of parts, whether the parts are computer languages or chips. And what, what sort of um, technologies or apps or, or businesses um, would arise that you think, I'd really like to invest in that? It's something that you personally what, think market that... Market segments? Yeah, I'm not a yeah. businessman. I was always, when we started Apple, I said, I will only start this company if I can be an engineer forever for all my life. Bottom of the org chart. I want to design stuff and write software. I can't do that these days. The life took me in different directions because I'm too open. But um, um, so the, uh, what was the question? I better get back to the. That's a I good better question. finish right. I, I can't remember. I think Something what, about business. Uh, well, so investments that, that you would make if someone sort of came I would up make. and said. So I'm not a businessman. I wouldn't run the business. I don't like to. Um, I don't like to really act superior to others and basically be above them and push them around and hire and fire them. I just can't do that kind of thing in life and um, disdain even the position, the wealth, and the power. So I um, don't think and I don't invest too often. Now I have joined a couple. I've, I've certainly had startups of my own. If we have an idea, wow, gung-ho, let's get some friends together and, and go in this direction. Um, I've even been swayed by friends a couple times that they had a clever idea, but I look at what is going on in the thinker's mind to come up with a new idea and a new approach. Are they really innovative? Do they have something that's different than other people? Is it special? Now, I get about a dozen emails a day of people that want me to look at their ideas and their products and let, me, let them give me a demo and talk me in and do I want to be an advisor. I am so out of time, I can rarely do that. But I meet with people, I meet with fans. I'll, you know, Every time I have free days, I'll meet them for lunch or dinner. And, um, this one group came into town one time, my town, Los Gatos, California. And these two founders told me about how they were building solid state disks. Okay, and solid state disks were starting to come into existence. The chips were still a little too expensive to have, very, to have a disk at a reasonable size, but some of us that are electronic and not mechanical, we don't want the spinning hard disk. We want to replace them with chips. Um, we love the, the solid state disks. You build a little solid state disk in a drive and you plug it in in place of a hard disk. Simple formula. Well, these guys that met me were doing something different. They put all the chips, maybe hundreds of them, to get the architecture to get high speed out of NAND flash chips, like the speed that's 100 times faster than a hard disk or a thousand times faster, and they plugged it straight into the server. With a little driver program, it can seem to be a hard disk, but it can also seem to be chips that implement a new kind of storage, slower than RAM, but faster than hard disks. And I thought, that is the architecture thinking that, oh my gosh, was the key to a lot of my thinking in the early Apple computers. It just fit so perfectly. So I joined that company. You know, I really believed in that one. and. Um, and they're a leader. By the time they went public, they had as big a public offering as Apple in constant dollar terms. It's Fusion I.O. out of Salt Lake City, although most of the workers are in Silicon Valley now, and worldwide. And we really did change um, all the networks. You used to get the data that you see on your smartphone. Most of the information is being organized from bits that are stored on hard disks out in the internet somewhere, out on servers. All big, whole, huge disk arrays, SAN arrays, and it's coming off of hard disk, right? Well, now I suspect that most of your data is probably coming off of our boards. Do any of you use Facebook ever or any social networks? Do any of you use Apple stuff or Siri? You know, or almost every major company in the world, the biggest companies are all using our boards and that's where your data is coming from. It's been a huge impact. You don't see it because it's not in your personal computer. But, um, so they, but they got my attention only because they had thought of a different approach than solid state disks. All the other companies like Intel and Micron that made NAND flash chips put them down and said, that's the wrong way to go. It's not a standard. It's so different. And now all those companies are coming our direction. Plug it into the PCI bus in the server. Plug in 10 of them. Get 30 terabytes or whatever in one server. And um, you, the speed is so fast that you, you only need one out of one-tenth as many servers to do the whole job. That's where the real savings are. What you want to estimate is not the cost per bit. 
A lot of people say the cost per bit of, of solid state disks is so much higher than hard disks. They can never keep up with a $100 terabyte hard disk. And that what's important to business is what is the cost to do the work you have to do. The cost, for example, for Facebook, for each transaction, what is the dollar cost of each transaction? If you simplify the formula, taking everything into account, that's what matters. So joining a company, one good way to make money. Uh, starting a company is another great way. Uh, another way that sort of cuts right to the, 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 the heart of the, of the thing is to just print your own cash, which you have done, I hear. No, not exactly. There's a, there's a <laughs> printer in my hometown of Los Gatos, California, and he makes pads of cash for me, and every page of the pad has four $2 bills. $2 is the most unusual bill in the United States. I like to do unusual things. And they're all perforated, so you tear them off like stamps. Turns out that these, these bills, they meet the specs of the US government. This printer gets the, gets the supplies from a high quality printer. They meet the specs of the US government. By law, that makes them legal tender. I should have brought one here to show, because I have one in my hotel. I thought about it. Um, and, um, and that's all you have to do. I don't know if it's the right president on the bills. You look at it, and you'll say the serial numbers are the same on every bill. How can that be legal? And the Secret Service is in charge of money in the United States, the counterfeit money. The Secret Service has approved my bills three times. Two of the times they actually saw the bills. And one time they read me what's called my Miranda rights, which is what you get read before you're arrested. And when they did that, I was thinking, you know, when they said they're going to read the Miranda rights to me, I thought two can play this game. So I gave them a fake ID that said I was a laser safety officer with an eye patch in the picture, and they bought it. <laughs> but they approved them, I guess, so they're legal tender. And I sell a sheet. These. I always sell a sheet of, everywhere I go, I sell a sheet of four $2 bills for $5 to anybody who wants to buy them. And I will tell you the truth. They do not cost me $4, $8 for one, four of them. And you can actually take these into shops and spend them. Yes, I've been doing it for 20 years. They're totally legal tender. Yeah, no question. Yeah, everything I've said is totally true, including the Secret Service. So, <laughs> and the fake ID. That fake ID, by the way, I used it for every airplane flight for five years of my life because I was, I was able to afford such a high quality printer. I could print photo IDs when the rest of the world with home computers couldn't print anything that looked like a photo. I had a dye sublimation printer and I'd make fake concert passes, you know the thing. But I had this, I based this on a Department of Defense card, but I changed the wording to Department of Defiance, but your brain never sees that. Your brain sees Department of Defense. But then if they ever caught me, I'd say it's not a fake card, it's a joke card. And they never caught me. Five years, every airplane flight in my life, laser safety officer with an eye patch. Amazing. Um, so anyway, yeah, now, there's more to that story, but I'll save it. You're, <laughs> You'll Fair. have to pick it up online. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so um, let's talk a little bit about uh, a little bit more about about Apple. Um, uh, one thing I read once: Is it true you have a secret key that lets you into various little doors and corridors around Apple HQ that most other people can't get to? Uh, <laughs> no. no. Around Apple? No. Yeah. I had a home once where I built a lot of fancy stuff, including yeah, a cave with museum styling, and I let the kids have secret passageways in the walls and climbing up in areas of the house. They could get to little kids' things, and they would design things where you had to pull a book out to get into one room, you know, or lift up part of the stairway, and you could sneak into a room that way. I let the kids go wild with their imagination, yeah. Uh, I, I could I have sworn I don't have was... that house anymore. <laughs> but. I could have sworn there was, there was an interview I once saw with you where you're talking about having this, this key to, to Apple. and uh, Key to Apple. Well, yeah. I know that, well, no, my, my badge, Steve Jobs would always give me a badge that had a, basically could open any door at Apple. Although I don't really use that much, but I've tested it. I think and that's maybe what I what I would heard. Yeah. Yeah. No. Just he was always very very uh, respectful and considerate to me in every way. Yeah. So how do you, when you, when you look at the the, the company today, I mean, how do you how do you um, how do you feel that it, its culture is evolving? Uh, either you know within the company, I know you know quite a lot of people obviously still within the business, uh, and also outside in terms of how it's how it's being viewed. Like how's, know, this, how's the cult of Mac? After this long, it's hard to evolve culture. It doesn't change very fast. There's inertia. The bigger something is, the bigger a company is, the slower it changes. And Apple's you know, reputation, the sort of people that buy Apple products are more about our culture than anything else. 
because they love us and they aren't going to love us if something comes out and they say, this is not the Apple way. They just sort of can, it's sort of like a type of art, how a product looks and feels and everything about it and, and the very newness is acceptable or it's not. You just sort of know if it's Apple or not. It's like you don't know if you're going to like a song until you actually hear it with your own ears. Uh, and that culture goes back to, I think, more than anything else, the, 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 the most, um, most, I don't know, emotional day of my life at Apple ever was the day that Steve Jobs introduced the Macintosh. And we all believed in it so much, we didn't know it was going to fail real hard at first. Um, and, and we played the 1984 commercial, you know, which you've all seen, you know, overthrowing, you know, contradictory thought will not be tolerated. And, and we're challenging that. You know, we were the new guys. We're going to bring the world some new life. And, and that's still, you know, very much the image and expectations of Apple. And you know what? You can't think of totally new directions, totally new um, type product categories, you can't think of those every year. You can't develop them every year, things that are that different. So the fact that Apple seems to be at plateaued for a while is fine with me. Um, you know, at least the, the products are, are good, exceptional, don't disappoint, and that's the main thing. And I still, I, I'm still sure that secretly, without knowing it, I don't have any inside knowledge. I don't want to. I think the secrecy and surprise to the world of great new products is very important for Apple's success. Uh, like we showed off the Lisa computer to Bill Gates at Microsoft, and sure enough, Microsoft was able to start planning and working, and a few years later come into that gooey computer market with Windows. But, you know, with the iPod and the iPhone, we sure didn't share those ideas with um, anybody <laughs> until, until we shared them with the, the world and shocked everyone. So I think that's what, you, what will happen, but you don't, you don't know when. A lot of things like the iPod and the iPhone and the iTunes music sales, you really didn't know what was going to happen until the day it did. And that's, I think that's good for Apple, the way Apple runs its business with a tight ecosystem. I love I'm not necessarily for that, but... A lot of these stories about, about the, so the early days of, of, of Apple and Macintosh and things like that, they, they are quite common subject matter for television programs and, and certainly films. And I'm curious how you, how you find um, how sort of you, yourself, and also the company are represented in some of these films. So there's a new one that's just uh, come out or just coming out. I think it's got Ashton sure. Kutcher in. Uh, well, you, for, you... first, how many of you in here saw Pirates of Silicon Valley? Quite a few. I, I was not, I got to the point where I wouldn't read Apple books because they had too many things wrong. If you were there, you couldn't stomach the, how they had things so wrong. I wouldn't watch Apple movies or anything, but I had a bootleg copy a month before it was on TV, and I popped it in for my wife to watch. And the first scene grabbed me. And then there I was, you know, Berkeley in the tear gas with a blue box and Steve Jobs. And I said, oh my God, that's how it was. And I loved that movie throughout. And um, each scene, when you make up a scene of history, you can never get the personalities of the people right because you don't know them. They're not in the press. You can't get the words they would have used right and the way they would have done it. But the implication of each scene in that movie, they were each things that actually did happen, not always in the right order, but the implied meaning of what they meant to the development of this industry was correct. So I thought that movie was very on the spot and loved watching it over and over and every school kid was shown it by teachers for quite a few years. Now the recent movie with Ashton Kushner, um, I was just so hopeful. Wow, a movie about Steve Jobs is going to be a big deal. His book was out and, and the trouble is the screenwriter, it was his first movie. He got the job because his father financed the movie and, and I hoped for a great movie and um, they, well, they asked me to consult. And then, but they had a script already written. They didn't ask to consult, and we'll write a script based on what we hear. They had it written, and my wife and I read it, and it was horrible. We had to say no. And the guy who really made Apple successful from day one that you don't hear much about, Mike Markula, our funder, our mentor, owned as much of the company as Steve Jobs and myself, he wouldn't touch it, and other people that were around that are really decent people, um, you know, high ethics and high, high credibility and, and all, they wouldn't touch that movie, so... Um, it was just going to be a bad movie. And I went to watch it the night it opened, hoping that it would still be entertaining. And not only was it very, very false of the picture it portrayed of what Steve Jobs was like in those early days. He, it, was he really a genius way above everyone else and seeing everything and directing things? Or was he more a student learning and learning to be a spokesperson and a face of Apple? Um, so it was very wrong about him 
and then scenes wherever it showed things with him and me. It showed him taking me to a computer club. This is a computer club that I took him to, that I'd been showing my computer off to for a long time, that I had been giving out my schematics for free, that I had helped other people build them before Steve even knew it existed. You know, and so they portrayed it so wrong. But the one that got me the most, when I met Steve Jobs, he was in high school and didn't have a lot of money, you know, as you are in high school. And, and he sort of knew one Bob Dylan song, like a Rolling Stone, and he would love this one line, if you ain't got nothing, you got nothing to lose. And, oh my gosh, I took him in. I had all the Dylan albums. That was my favorite artist in the world. I didn't have any Beatles albums. I showed him the liner notes to the vague songs and the weird interviews with Bob Dylan and took him downtown to stores where we could buy bootleg records. I brought him into the whole Dylan world, and, then the, and we would say that Dylan was important because he spoke about life and meaning and what you have to think about and important to how you treat people. And the Beatles music is really nice music, but it's just for, it's simple on that way, it's pop. So we put down Beatles music. And there they are in the music, making Steve Jobs Dylan and me Beatles. <laughs> you know, anybody else, that, obviously Ashton Kushner himself did not come from a time frame when he would have known what I was about, including a lot of very high credibility and, uh, you know, I cannot be bought. He was saying that I'd been paid by another company to consult on their movie, and that's why I was saying bad things about it. Of course, what I said matched 400 reviewers. But uh, he didn't know my, my, my background in the whole business. And the reason is, Ashton Kushner's younger. He didn't grow up in our time frame. When we were doing hardware and software, I like to say he was doing diapers and underwear. Because he came from modeling underwear, if you know that part of the story. It's a joke. Um, but... Um, uh, he shut up. He shut up pretty quickly because anything I said about it, I just said the movie, you know what? If it had been entertaining and totally false, I would have loved it. It's, it would have been fun, but it didn't have that fun. I wanted to also see Steve Jobs as somebody you just admire so much and you hate things about him, but it was really weak in the scenes where it showed that stuff. A um, couple of really good parts in the movie, yeah, like where um, he would be reading the lines to the Think Different campaign. You know, a lot of good things that, that fit him, but... It portrayed a time in Apple when all Steve had was failure, 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 not one success in the company, except for the starting with the Apple II. His business thinking and doing marketing and all that for it, but um, he failed at computer after computer after computer in the time frame of this movie. He never really had a success until he came back to Apple. He was more mature, he was patient, he knew to take the time to build a market, not expect it instantly. <clears throat> um, he really learned how to build a company with a lot of outstanding support. And, but that came about the, the Steve Jobs we love now for the iPhone and turning the world onto smartphones is not um, what the part of the time frame of this movie was. But they portrayed him like he was always that way. No, he was always trying to be that way, but so it's hard to explain. So go see the movie. Any publicity, even negative publicity, is good publicity. So whether I say something bad or reviewers say something bad, you'll go see it. And wait for the Sony movie. The Sony movie is a big budget one based on Steve Jobs' book. Got the best writer in America, Aaron Sorkin, writing the screenplay. And it's got to do something like $200 million at the box office to break even. This is a big budget movie. And I don't think they've even started on the script yet, or I haven't seen any, any evidence of that. But I expect more from that movie. And Aaron Sorkin has said he's going to show it as three real-time half-hour scenes. The introduction of the Macintosh, the introduction of the next computer of Steve Jobs, and the introduction of the iPod, which was really Steve's big Apple II that doubled the value of the company. Um, and, they're and that's going to be great because with tight dialogue, they'll show all the conflicts and the thinking and what Steve Jobs' mind is really about um, by having you know, the greatest writer. That's, that's what will come out of it. But until then, until then, Pirates of Silicon Valley. Pirates of Silicon Valley, no, yeah, and go, go see the other one too, <laughs> but you just, you know, even if you're an Apple fan, you're just going to be very disappointed as movies go. Well, I think we're going to open up questions to the floor. I imagine hands will start flying in a moment. There's a microphone that's going to roam around with the assistance of someone. Here, oh, there's three, okay. Uh, so, who's got a question? Uh, there's a hand right there on, on the end. Yes. Good morning. Um, really a pleasure to have you here. I'm a user experience specialist, and I'm dying to ask you, what do you think of iOS 7? Uh, interesting question. User experience is extremely important to me. 
Um, I got swayed around, not when we started Apple, but when a guy named Jeff Raskin joined us and said, you've got to make products that are easily understood. You've got to put your software into the technology to work in human ways rather than forcing the human to learn all these weird commands to make the technology work. And I became so swayed. I call it the Macintosh dreams of computers that are so obvious and they, they think for you and think ahead of you and all that stuff. Um, iOS 7 didn't really change my life a lot from iOS 6 as far as how I use the machine. We're mostly now we're in an app world and you use, and I didn't really change what apps I'm using. Um, I tend to, at first I was a little disappointed that iOS 7 on the iPhone had different icon, the icons looked different, you were so used to the way they were. And it bothers me occasionally when I'm looking for something and it seems to fade into the background by being transparent. Um, so I have those problems, but overall I judge it um, after using it for a week, you know, longer time period. I came around and I felt that it is actually more beautiful. I like the lighter, thinner lines. I really like the style. To me, it's a type of a higher level of coolness beauty than, than we had in iOS 6. Um, so I, I do like it and I don't really have any problems with it. And, I like um, and any the benefits that it added. I, I forget what they are, but I, I'm, I like them all a bit. So I think it was um, a good step. And that doesn't mean that everything's perfect about it because nothing's ever perfect about any product. So, but there's a, be an evolution. So we'll see. Uh, the next question, we've got a, a chap yeah. over there who's had his hand up, I think, for the duration of the previous question. So it seems Ooh, fair. This guy? Yes. Hey Steve, thanks for the great talk. I just wanted to ask, um, I've sort of two questions. The first question is, uh, how do you feel that, you know, like technology is getting smaller, we all have smartphones and it's come to wearable technology. Um, you know, the Mac kind of made computers more personal and it kind of made people love their computers more instead of the big kind of clunky machines that people went in and used office equipment. So how do you feel like, you know, sort of smartphones are making, you know, these kind of things more personal than the, the personal computer made it? Yeah, I, and my second yeah. question, sorry, is um, are there any kind of, what are your favorite apps right now? What, what, are your, what do you like? Okay. I spoke about um, okay, yeah. that a bit, yeah. that the phone is becoming so personal. It's like a close friend, and I get to speak to it the way I would okay, speak to a yeah. human. And I'm starting to like that a lot. My life got changed a lot with the Newton message pad. It was the first PDA in the world from Apple, long time ago. A tablet that would be a little like an iPad mini and you used a stylus, and you could handwrite with your own handwriting. How personal, how human could you get? The first day I had it, I hand wrote a message to myself, a reminder. I hand wrote Sarah, my daughter, dentist, Tuesday, 2 p.m. And then I saw a button called Assist. I was in an airport at the time, and I clicked Assist. It noticed what I had just written. It opened up the calendar. Tuesday at 2 p.m., it put in dentist, and it grabbed Sarah out of my contact list. And I said, that changed my life forever. I said, I want computers that I operate in the human world and handwrite things or speak them normally without thinking of procedures, and it understands me. So, um, so I don't know. So that's that personalization. It becomes more like a part of me. People walk around with their smartphones now, and it's like so close to them. That's the key thing. You don't, you know, all day long, you know, especially young people. So, uh, like I said, I mean, that's very personal, and I, and I like it. It's just getting become more a part of us, and who knows, that's going to continue, um, artificial intelligence-wise. What was the second part of your question? My favorite app. Oh, gosh. My favorite app has been for a, actually a long time, Siri, before Apple even owned Siri, because I got to, just like my watch, I just feel like I'm not working hard to think out a question like, how far is it from Kathmandu to Timbuktu? And I get an answer. And um, so that's definitely my favorite. I also, uh, I like, um, I, I have a very busy life these days, a lot of travel. And my wife and I played with a lot of apps so we could see where each weather was. And latitude on the iPhone wasn't automatic like on the Android phones and didn't solve the problem well. So finally I, I went on Foursquare and I said, I'll check in the places I go to and you'll always see where I am. So I actually use Foursquare a lot. Um, the social apps, the web apps like Facebook and Twitter, I have a horrible time getting into those. Short of time, and you got 5,000 friends or whatever, and you don't know any of them, and they're all sending emails all day long because I have philosophies about being accessible and open, and, and it's like I don't have time to go in and be proactive using them. 
Twitter would be just such a great thing for somebody like me. But So I just live as sort of a recipient of the benefits of a lot of those apps um, that are important to me. Of course, I use my calendar is crucial in my life. Um, I, I, I like to play a couple of games on my phone. and um, I, I look at the end of a day, and I've got 30 apps I used. Every one of those apps was critical to me at the time I used it. So it's not just one. It's a very a plethora. And I'm sure almost everybody in the audience would say exactly the same things. Um, the only app that I've never used once on my iPhone is the Apple Stock app, the Stock Quote app, because I just don't ever like to deal with money. We've got a question just down here. This chap. Thank you. Hi, Steve. David from Dreamy Get It. Um, you mentioned and you're known for wanting um, computers to be more human-like. We saw that the App Store has got a million apps. Do you think that discoverability and improvement in that field will be an important next step? And as a second question is, you haven't mentioned any apps that are linked to jokes. Is that something that uh, you Hold use? On. Which one would be your favorite Up one? Up here, we have harder time with the echoing. Could you repeat it a little louder? Sure. Or something. Um, discoverability, I believe, has to be... Uh, improve when you have an app store with a million uh, apps. Billion. A billion apps, sorry. Oh, 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 in a million apps and yeah. different apps, yeah. And second question is, do you have a, a jokes app that you prefer? A joke app that I prefer? I do not have a joke app that I prefer. I get so many jokes just through standard email all day long on my computer. Um, it, w spreading of jokes and humor and sm funny videos is a huge part of life, much more than ever before in my life, and I'm very glad for what we have in that respect. And the first part of your question... What? Discoverability. Discoverability yes. of what? I don't understand. Sorry. I, I'm sorry. You said that you're famous, to, um, you're famous for wanting computers to behave more like... Um, human, to, to have yeah. more human computer interaction, oh. to be more like humans. Yeah, here's a question. My whole life, computers were never going to be as smart as people. The first big program I ever wrote in high school, I'm, we didn't have computers in our school, but I got to go down program one at a company, and it was a knight's tour of chess where the knight has to hit every square on the chessboard once. <coughs> and this was great. I get to program a computer. Who's ever heard of a, a computer? It's further out than rocket science. Computer does a million things a second. And nothing came out of my program. It was trying, you know, every alternative, and nothing came out. And then I did a calculation. It was going to take 10 to the 25th years to get the solution. And, um, and what that taught me was computers can do things fast. They can calculate things fast, but the method has to come from a human brain. It's that intu intuitive side. And we don't know a thing about how the brain is wired. And that's true to this day. I almost got my degree in psychology, did a lot of study on it. And there's a lot of tests and experiments and things like that. They don't know at all how the brain is wired, even where memories are stored. Are they in the brain at all? Or are they down in your toe? We don't even know that. And uh, we act like we do know these things. Um, so how could a computer ever equal a brain? Look at a child learning to talk. You learn, you go through the world, you hear people, and by after two years, you sort of learn how to speak. That's not how we want to program it into a computer. We want to program it into it right away. It's called simulated intelligence instead of artificial intelligence. It's not intelligent in the way we humans are, so we haven't hit the formula. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You used to ask a person with a brain a smart question, right? A difficult question. And now who do you ask? It starts with G-O, and it's not God. Google, and you get back all these answers. Wait a minute, we didn't invent the internet to be a brain. We never intended it. We technical guys wanted to hook wires up and see if we could establish four centers, five centers, all sharing some kind of connection, and then sharing data files, and then remotely accessible, and then sharing email. And eventually when the internet came to the masses, that was the ARPANET. When the internet came to the masses, everybody had so much information we had to sort it. It was too much to find. We had to sort it. Yahoo was a great search engine, Alta Vista. Now we got Google, and it replaces a lot of what we used to use brains for. So it came about unexpectedly. Now the question is, are, the, are our computers in our pocket going to become like real people? Get conscious. Is it going to be conscious? And all my life I said, no, we don't know how the brain's wired. It'll never be real consciousness. Um, Ray Kurzweil wrote a book, Singularity sort of predicting when computers would equal a human brain. And I said, that's ridiculous. Every effort in artificial intelligence has been 
overblown. A machine that can pick out a blue ball and put it in a blue box is simple little programming. It's nothing like intelligence. You know, and even chess is kind of just brute force um, methodology. It took a long, long time for chess to beat a human. But we always change the definition of intelligence anyway. Um, would it ever happen? And then about two years ago, for the first time in my life, I changed my mind. I'm seeing too many signs, like Google replacing a brain, like, like IBM's Watson computer beating the humans at a, at, at a, at a, a Jeopardy competition on television, like speaking natural language to Siri and having it understand me sometimes, and even Google, even Android, I mean. And I'm starting to think, would this thing ever be a person, as smart as a person, think as fast as a human, just like can you make cameras that can see things humans can't? And you can. Will they ever be part of our brain? I don't know. But um, this thing has a sense of touch, like a human has a sense of touch. It's got a sense of hearing with a microphone, like we have ears. It has a sense of sight, like we have eyes. It has a sense of motion, like our inner ear. Um, now, when I wake up in the morning, I often have to ask myself, what, what part of the world am I in? But it knows it from GPS. So it's got us there. It doesn't have a sense of smell. But you know, input and output is really what defines a human being. So is this ever going to be? And I'm starting to think that Ray Kurzweil's method of predicting maybe 20 years from now uh, there'll be a crossover and these things will be as smart as humans. It's scary if you take the, extend that out like science fiction writers as to what it might imply. But it's very different than a lot of science fiction too if you think deeply about it. And I'm thinking maybe it's going to be 20 to 200 years because there might be stalling points. Moore's Law. We might be at an end with Moore's Law and not be able to make bigger and bigger computers in smaller, lower power size. Um, because we're getting down to the point where NAND flash chips, we store a bit, a one or a zero with eight electrons. You can't go much lower than that and get it right. So, so I think we've got about ten, 10 minutes or so, so a couple more questions. I've got one down here on the, on the front row. Hi. Um, wonderful, really interesting talk. Thank you. Um, I wanted to get your opinion on the Raspberry Pi. Um, yes. I know. I think. I think at some point a few months ago, you said you were interested in it. Um, have you been? Have you been using it? Do you think that this is represents something in the future for us, or do you think it requires too much input from people? It doesn't. It doesn't really follow that rule about making things that are easy for people to use, or what? Then again, it's another you know turn towards us thinking more. Less Raspberry, Google. Raspberry Pi. I like to buy a lot of the, especially the hot and common things that are coming about that you hear about that either sound cool and interesting or a lot of people are going to have them. And I got myself a Raspberry Pi and I set it up and, and um, I started reading the book by Ewan, what is his name, um, the guy that invented it. His, he wanted a device that would teach young people how computers actually worked and how they could control things and how to have your own and be a builder and be a, you know, a do-it-yourselfer. And his goals, as I read, the, read the, er, the forward to the book, were the same as my goals with the Apple II. I had learned so much seeing other people's prior development and looking at it, and that's how I learned. I didn't have books that taught me computer design or software. I just thought about it and did it pretty much learning on my own. I, I wanted the Apple II to be that machine turn the world on to learning what a computer's about. I wanted to publish all, the, all the, the schematics and the listings, and we did, and give out packs to developers of all the code I'd written just so they could learn the way I had learned. Well, that's what the Raspberry Pi was largely about. Now, when I was making my little boot-up disk on a, an SD card for the Raspberry Pi, I'm following all the instructions, and it's not working. It's not copying the final file. It won't accept the command. And I finally went online, and I researched for about an hour and found on a Macintosh, maybe you have to use a lowercase z instead of an uppercase z at the end of the statement. And I thought, I don't know, I thought we were trying to get away from this kind of stuff. <laughs> the older days were pretty hard. Um, I have a busy life, so I haven't gone very far with my Raspberry Pi, but it's a delight in my life, and I plan to try to use it the way people use it and learn what they experience so I can um, uh, talk very closely with people using it once I get a little more time. We'll try and squeeze in just two really, really quick ones. They've got five minutes. Uh, there's just one right at the back that, uh, in the scarf. Hello. Um, I, I'm personally not a developer, but this is just a question about um, uh, your, your relating to your engineer question and, and finding uh, special people to, to, to start companies with. You know, uh, obviously, since your time starting with Steve, uh, technologies change, people have 
really caught on to this huge new market and, and they've changed. You know, they, they, they obviously uh, saw your success and, you know, want to do what you did, achieve the, the glory, the, the money. And um, there's a lot, lot of changes that, that have been made to people in technology. And I was just wondering, um, what, what's your or was just some advice you would give to someone who's trying to find people outside that kind of that kind of scope of of people you know a lot more like you just kind of more yeah. easygoing nice guys who <laughs> who I've uh, had I yes yeah, so I'll answer that I have had startup companies of my own where I wanted to find other Steve Wozniaks too to hire and I can't come up with the formula the best I can say is look for young people usually at on university you know usually not not and, and look for somebody that's not so much into well accomplished in getting good grades, answering all the questions on tests the same way as everyone else so they get a perfect score. Because those answers are not their own answers. They're out of a book if everyone else is doing the same things. Look for the people that have some inner ideas and talk about a passion. They have to love some area in life. And if that's something you want to do for maybe a company trial, go with it. Also know that um, Young people, as they develop, the great little technical people that know how to build things, make sure they are builders. Make sure they have built things, whether it's software or hardware, And because you want to have a working model always before you go out and raise money. You want to be able to demonstrate really accurately what you're doing, but look for people. You know, Generally, they'll, they'll just design something cool that's fun, doesn't have any value, doesn't make any money. Design another thing. It's cool, it's fun. Build another thing, and it's cool, it's fun. And every time you've increased your ability, you never go backwards. You always go forwards, and you use the techniques you've come up with to, um, um, to uh, create things. You actually learn how to create new solutions that were not in a book. You learn how to write the book yourself. How do you spot the people? They're very rare. I've run into a couple in my life, and I can tell and I know it, but it's very difficult to, um, to um, just go out there and advertise for it. <clears throat> Obviously, a company like Apple would never hire Steve Jobs or myself today um, because, you know, experience levels and college degrees and all that stuff, which is one of the reasons that sometimes the big breakthroughs happen that you never expected. They happen to young kids that weren't in college, you know, didn't finish college. Um, so, but you, skills are important too. Skills at building things, but not necessarily skills at, like, um, it, it's better if, it's better if, it's better if you've worked with little, little money, having to figure out ways to make things inexpensive, and you've never done them before, but you can figure out a way to do it on your own without reading somebody else's method. And in the very last two minutes, you need to take one from this side. There at the back, over there. Where am I going? Oh, thank you. You're last. Hi, Steve. Tony Wells from Cloud Testers. Thanks for talking to us all today. Um, in an apps world, how would you uh, balance speed to market with quality assurance and testing? That's very difficult to say because there's a wide range of what the word apps means. A lot of apps can be just very simple. You're getting your feet wet. You're learning how to get them through app stores and get them just published, and they're going to be for free. And then there's other apps that are trying to build a company that needs certain revenues. And the app, a popular app, will go to, you know, a million people, 10 million, even more, <coughs> if it's a successful popular app. And that implies you have to have a lot of testing because one of the most important things is is that things work reliably and they work the way you expect it to. What I hate the most about everything in computers is when I take some logical steps for a human and it doesn't understand me and it doesn't and it doesn't give the right answer and doesn't work the way I want. Also I don't like it when things get inconsistent and they change and move around and and I take the steps I know and it doesn't work. The human being user is the one you've got to think of uh, most importantly. I hope that's a good enough answer, if not everything. I'm afraid we're all out of time. Thank you all for being here. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, Steve Wozniak.